This is the Cambridge Assessment International Education, Cambridge IGCSE, November 2021 examination in English as a second language. Paper 4. Listening. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready. Here is the exam. Exercise 1. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words for each answer. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. Which subject does the girl think she will study at university? B. What is the boy looking forward to most about being at university? What did you think of that careers talk we had yesterday? I thought it was quite helpful. It's actually made me change my mind about what degree course I'd like to do at university. You know, I've been considering doing maths. Well, I reckon I'd have a better chance of getting a good job if I did computing instead. What about you? I guess you'll do a science subject. I'm not sure yet. We've still got two more years at school first. Even so, I'm quite excited about it. Me too. It's the freedom that I really can't wait for. I suppose meeting new people will be cool too. What did you think of that careers talk we had yesterday? I thought it was quite helpful. It's actually made me change my mind about what degree course I'd like to do at university. You know, I've been considering doing maths. Well, I reckon I'd have a better chance of getting a good job if I did computing instead. What about you? I guess you'll do a science subject. I'm not sure yet. We've still got two more years at school first. Even so, I'm quite excited about it. Me too. It's the freedom that I really can't wait for. I suppose meeting new people will be cool too. Question 2. A. What do the students dislike most about the school canteen? B. What will the chefs use less of in school meals in the future? One more thing, then you can go to your classrooms. Remember we asked you all to complete a survey about the school canteen? We've looked at your responses and we're thinking about how to improve it. You identified several issues, including the long queue at lunchtime. But noise is your main concern. Most of you think the cost is reasonable. And regarding food, as you know, the chefs are already producing more healthy options, including low-fat meals. And they've reduced the amount of sugar, too. And they'll now start to cut down on salt in their cooking. You can let them know what you think next week. One more thing, then you can go to your classrooms. Remember we asked you all to complete a survey about the school canteen? We've looked at your responses and we're thinking about how to improve it. You identified several issues, including the long queue at lunchtime. But noise is your main concern. Most of you think the cost is reasonable. And regarding food, as you know, the chefs are already producing more healthy options, including low-fat meals. And they've reduced the amount of sugar, too and they'll now start to cut down on salt in their cooking. You can let them know what you think next week. Question 3. A. In which room did the police find the robot? B. Who called the police? Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's this newspaper article. Apparently, the police thought there was a burglar in a house, so they climbed in through the kitchen window. They checked the rooms downstairs. 
Then when they were in the living room, they heard something upstairs, so they shouted, telling the suspect to come down. Eventually, they entered the bathroom where they discovered a robot vacuum cleaner. Was it a neighbor who contacted the police? It says that the house owners were both at work. They had a guest staying and had forgotten to tell him the robot was programmed to start at one o'clock. So when he heard noises, he phoned the police. Why are you laughing? <laughs> It's this newspaper article. Apparently, the police thought there was a burglar in a house, so they climbed in through the kitchen window. They checked the rooms downstairs. Then, when they were in the living room, they heard something upstairs, so they shouted, telling the suspect to come down. Eventually, they entered the bathroom where they discovered a robot vacuum cleaner. Was it a neighbor who contacted the police? It says that the house owners were both at work. They had a guest staying and had forgotten to tell him the robot was programmed to start at one o'clock. So when he heard noises, he phoned the police. Question four. A. When can the man pick up the guidebook? B. What is the name of the hotel that the woman recommends? Mark, hi, it's Jenny here. I've found the guidebook that I told you about. I could post it to you tomorrow, but you might not get it until Saturday. I know you're busy on Friday, so why don't you come here on Thursday to get it? It'll be really useful for your trip. I also had to think about places for you to stay. There are lots of options. Lakeview is the one I'd go for, as the rooms are really big, and it's got even better reviews than City Lights which is where I stayed in the summer. Anyway, give me a call when you get this message. Bye. Mark, hi, it's Jenny here. I've found the guidebook that I told you about. I could post it to you tomorrow, but you might not get it until Saturday. I know you're busy on Friday, so why don't you come here on Thursday to get it? It'll be really useful for your trip. I also had to think about places for you to stay. There are lots of options. Lakeview is the one I'd go for, as the rooms are really big, and it's got even better reviews than City Lights, which is where I stayed in the summer. Anyway, give me a call when you get this message. Bye. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment, You will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise two. You will hear a student giving a talk to his class about a project to plant trees. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words or a number in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. As you know, every day this week, a different student has to give a short talk on a topic related to the environment. My talk's about a tree planting project, which began because of two young children called Chloe and Daniel Wilde. I came across a magazine article about how it started that said that they'd been watching a TV documentary, which made them feel quite unhappy, as it showed how quickly rainforests are being destroyed in some parts of the world. While their father was making a meal for them that evening, they told him about it and asked what they could do. Without thinking too much, he made a promise, which he hoped would make them feel better. He told them not to worry and said that they would do something to replace those trees. At that time, their father was a senior manager of a company which produces and sells tea, and he persuaded his company to help him. This was back in 1989, and it was only a few months afterwards, in early 1990, that the initial tree was planted in Harrogate, the town in the north of England where the family lived. By 2007, the company had planted more than three million trees. 
A few years later, in 2014, the company stated that they would plant another million trees, some in the UK, but also some in Kenya, which, along with China, India and Sri Lanka, is one of the main countries which exports tea to the UK. They were keen to plant more because it was, and still is, widely recognised that more trees are needed in the environment. That's because trees are good for our health and happiness, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and decrease the chance of floods occurring when there's a lot of rain. They also provide food and shelter for all sorts of animals, birds and insects. Many of the farms where the company's tea is grown are on land that was once covered with beautiful forest. Cutting down the trees created plenty of land for the farms, which have been very successful. Although the farmers had so much space, it was all taken up with fields of tea plants, so they didn't grow any vegetables or have any wood for heating and cooking. They had to purchase these, which didn't make sense. The company talked to the farmers about the types of tree that would benefit them most and came up with three main species to plant around their farms. One of these is a species of oak tree which grows quickly and doesn't need too much water. The farmers now use these trees as shelter from the sun and to build fences which are put up round their land. The other two are avocado trees which provide plenty of fruit for the farmers to eat and macadamia trees which produce delicious nuts. Both of these can generate income too as the farmers can sell what they don't need. Now I'll show you some pictures of the trees that have been planted. Now you will hear the talk again. As you know, every day this week, a different student has to give a short talk on a topic related to the environment. My talk's about a tree planting project, which began because of two young children called Chloe and Daniel Wild. I came across a magazine article about how it started that said that they'd been watching a TV documentary which made them feel quite unhappy as it showed how quickly rainforests are being destroyed in some parts of the world. While their father was making a meal for them that evening, they told him about it and asked what they could do. Without thinking too much, he made a promise, which he hoped would make them feel better. He told them not to worry and said that they would do something to replace those trees. At that time, their father was a senior manager of a company which produces and sells tea, and he persuaded his company to help him. This was back in 1989, and it was only a few months afterwards, in early 1990, that the initial tree was planted in Harrogate, the town in the north of England where the family lived. By 2007, the company had planted more than 3 million trees. A few years later, in 2014, the company stated that they would plant another million trees, some in the UK, but also some in Kenya, which, along with China, India and Sri Lanka, is one of the main countries which exports tea to the UK. They were keen to plant more because it was, and still is, widely recognised that more trees are needed in the environment. That's because trees are good for our health and happiness, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and decrease the chance of floods occurring when there's a lot of rain. They also provide food and shelter for all sorts of animals, birds and insects. Many of the farms where the company's tea is grown are on land that was once covered with beautiful forest. Cutting down the trees created plenty of land for the farms, which have been very successful. Although the farmers had so much space, it was all taken up with fields of tea plants, so they didn't grow any vegetables or have any wood for heating and cooking. They had to purchase these, which didn't make sense. 
The company talked to the farmers about the types of tree that would benefit them most and came up with three main species to plant around their farms. One of these is a species of oak tree which grows quickly and doesn't need too much water. The farmers now use these trees as shelter from the sun and to build fences which are put up round their land. The other two are avocado trees which provide plenty of fruit for the farmers to eat and macadamia trees which produce delicious nuts. Both of these can generate income too as the farmers can sell what they don't need. Now I'll show you some pictures of the trees that have been planted. That is the end of the talk. In a moment, you will hear exercise three. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 3. You will hear six students talking about their school trip to Finland, a country in Northern Europe. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list, A to G, which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1 Our college organises a trip each year. This year it was to Finland, in winter. I'd never been on a winter holiday before, or tried most of the activities we did. Anyway, it was freezing. One day it was minus 25 degrees. We'd been warned it could be that cold, and even colder at night time. On the last two nights, there weren't any clouds, and we were lucky enough to see the amazing colours of the northern lights in the sky. That's something I'd wanted to do since I was little. Speaker 2 The activity week in Finland was brilliant. I'd been worried about it beforehand, as it was the first time I'd been away without my family. It's made me realise I'm capable of more than I thought. We did different activities each day, like cross-country skiing and walking with snowshoes on. That was really popular, and some of the others said they'd have liked to do that again on another day. On the last day we built igloos out of snow on the frozen lake, which none of us had done before. Speaker 3 If you're thinking about going on the activity week next winter, I'd really recommend it. I've never seen so much snow. The weather was much colder than any of us expected, but the activities more than made up for that, especially the ones which were new to me, like walking with snowshoes on, which takes a bit of getting used to. You don't need to be super fit, though the cross-country skiing is hard work. It's a great way of warming up. Speaker 4 I've been skiing before, but that was downhill skiing in the mountains. So when we went to Finland, it was the first time I tried cross-country skiing. I couldn't believe how tiring it was. I thought I was in quite good shape, but maybe I was wrong. I'm going to go to the gym more regularly from now on. I liked it best when we did the activities all together. Though on one day, there were three or four different things we could choose between. So we were in smaller groups then. Speaker 5
I was really looking forward to going on sledges pulled by dogs. That's something I've always wanted to do. It was just my luck that that activity was cancelled at the last minute. Anyway, we walked across a frozen lake instead, which was amazing. I was rather scared at first, though we all felt really confident with our guide. It was so cold all week, but with all the layers of clothes on, including two pairs of gloves, it actually wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Speaker 6 I've been on school trips before where we've gone to museums and things like that. This holiday was completely different. I'm really into sport and we spent the whole week doing activities outdoors. It was brilliant. Most days the programme was fixed and we all did stuff together, but on one day we could pick one of three different activities, which was a welcome change. I went for ice climbing. It was only for a couple of hours, but actually that was enough. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 Our college organises a trip each year. This year it was to Finland, in winter. I'd never been on a winter holiday before, or tried most of the activities we did. Anyway, it was freezing. One day it was minus 25 degrees. We'd been warned it could be that cold, and even colder at night time. On the last two nights, there weren't any clouds, and we were lucky enough to see the amazing colours of the northern lights in the sky. That's something I'd wanted to do since I was little. Speaker 2 The activity week in Finland was brilliant. I've been worried about it beforehand, as it was the first time I've been away without my family. It's made me realise I'm capable of more than I thought. We did different activities each day, like cross-country skiing and walking with snowshoes on. That was really popular, and some of the others said they'd have liked to do that again on another day. On the last day we built igloos out of snow on the frozen lake, which none of us had done before. Speaker 3 If you're thinking about going on the activity week next winter, I'd really recommend it. I've never seen so much snow. The weather was much colder than any of us expected, but the activities more than made up for that, especially the ones which were new to me, like walking with snowshoes on, which takes a bit of getting used to. You don't need to be super fit, though the cross-country skiing is hard work. It's a great way of warming up. Speaker 4 I've been skiing before, but that was downhill skiing in the mountains. So when we went to Finland, it was the first time I tried cross-country skiing. I couldn't believe how tiring it was. I thought I was in quite good shape, but maybe I was wrong. I'm going to go to the gym more regularly from now on. I liked it best when we did the activities all together, though on one day there were three or four different things we could choose between. So we were in smaller groups then. Speaker 5 I was really looking forward to going on sledges pulled by dogs. That's something I've always wanted to do. It was just my luck that that activity was cancelled at the last minute. Anyway, we walked across a frozen lake instead, which was amazing. I was rather scared at first, though we all felt really confident with our guide. It was so cold all week, but with all the layers of clothes on, including two pairs of gloves, it actually wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Speaker 6 I've been on school trips before where we've gone to museums and things like that. This holiday was completely different. I'm really into sport and we spent the whole week doing activities outdoors. It was brilliant. 
Most days the programme was fixed and we all did stuff together, but on one day we could pick one of three different activities, which was a welcome change. I went for ice climbing. It was only for a couple of hours, but actually that was enough. That is the end of exercise 3. In a moment, you will hear exercise 4. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 4. You will hear an interview with a student called Helen about her involvement in helping to clean up rubbish in the environment. Listen to the interview and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. Next in the program, I'm going to talk to a student who's helping to solve the problem of rubbish in our environment. Helen, thanks for coming in today. I'll start by asking you how you became aware of this issue. Well, we were told we all had to give a presentation in class at school, and I wasn't sure what to do it on. Then on the way home that day, I was listening to the news in my dad's car. There was a story about a group of surfers who were cleaning up beaches around the world. I just thought I'd like to be involved. So I wrote to my cousin about it, as he lives by the seaside in France. Then you actually helped in a beach cleanup, didn't you? Yes. I went to stay with my cousin and we did it together. Lots of people turned up, children and adults. My cousin had said that would happen. What was great was knowing that we were doing something positive and useful. But it made me realise how big the problem of rubbish really is, and that there's no obvious solution. Did you enjoy doing the beach cleanup? I did. I spent most of the day working with my cousin, although I know I should have taken the opportunity to speak more French by talking to all the other people there. While we were working, we played some of our favourite songs which we had on our phones, and that really helped to pass the time. What sort of rubbish did you find? Oh, all sorts. Uh, plastic bags, bottles, bits of glass, rope, all the stuff you'd expect to find. We'd been told that on average, each person picks up several hundred pieces during the day. What I hadn't realised beforehand was that all these things break down over time and that a lot of what we picked up would be really tiny. It made me wonder how much more there was that we couldn't even see. We now know that there's a huge problem with plastic in the ocean, isn't there? Yes, that's quite clear now. It's too late to prevent it, but what everyone should be told more about is the effect it's having on wildlife, and on us too. If we can get clear information on that, I'm sure more people will feel like getting involved. So many people are already trying to use less plastic in their lives, which is a good thing, but there's more to be done. And now you've decided to arrange a clean-up event yourself in your own neighbourhood. That's right. We were all encouraged to do this by the person who organised the beach clean-up. She gave a thank you speech at the end, which I think was really important. I'll definitely do that. She also suggested informing as many people in advance as possible, using a range of media, which I've been doing. I'm lucky that a company in the town has donated some money to print posters, too. Have you got many volunteers yet? Uh, about 30 so far, but we're hoping to double that. On the form that they fill in, we ask them a bit about their motivation for taking part. It seems that doing something for the neighbourhood is the main reason, though some said they just like being in the open air, too. I think we'll still get quite a few more retired people to help, as they have more time than many of us. And finally, what are your plans for the future? Well, some people have suggested that we should organise regular meetings to keep people involved and interested. We could do a range of things to improve the environment and get involved in projects in other areas too. I'm thinking about that, but my priority right now is to get a place at university, and I'm hoping to study environmental science. I can't wait. Well, good luck with that. Thank you, Helen.
Now you will hear the interview again. Next in the program, I'm going to talk to a student who's helping to solve the problem of rubbish in our environment. Helen, thanks for coming in today. I'll start by asking you how you became aware of this issue. Well, we were told we all had to give a presentation in class at school, and I wasn't sure what to do it on. Then on the way home that day, I was listening to the news in my dad's car. There was a story about a group of surfers who were cleaning up beaches around the world. I just thought I'd like to be involved. So I wrote to my cousin about it, as he lives by the seaside in France. Then you actually helped in a beach cleanup, didn't you? Yes. I went to stay with my cousin and we did it together. Lots of people turned up, children and adults. My cousin had said that would happen. What was great was knowing that we were doing something positive and useful. But it made me realise how big the problem of rubbish really is and that there's no obvious solution. Did you enjoy doing the beach cleanup? I did. I spent most of the day working with my cousin, although I know I should have taken the opportunity to speak more French by talking to all the other people there. While we were working, we played some of our favourite songs which we had on our phones, and that really helped to pass the time. What sort of rubbish did you find? Oh, all sorts. Uh, plastic bags, bottles, bits of glass, rope, all the stuff you'd expect to find. We've been told that on average, each person picks up several hundred pieces during the day. What I hadn't realised beforehand was that all these things break down over time and that a lot of what we picked up would be really tiny. It made me wonder how much more there was that we couldn't even see. We now know that there's a huge problem with plastic in the ocean, isn't there? Yes, that's quite clear now. It's too late to prevent it, but what everyone should be told more about is the effect it's having on wildlife and on us too. If we can get clear information on that, I'm sure more people will feel like getting involved. So many people are already trying to use less plastic in their lives, which is a good thing, but there's more to be done. And now you've decided to arrange a cleanup event yourself in your own neighbourhood. That's right. We were all encouraged to do this by the person who organised the beach cleanup. She gave a thank you speech at the end, which I think was really important. I'll definitely do that. She also suggested informing as many people in advance as possible, using a range of media, which I've been doing. I'm lucky that a company in the town has donated some money to print posters, too. Have you got many volunteers yet? Uh, about 30 so far, but we're hoping to double that. On the form that they fill in, we ask them a bit about their motivation for taking part. It seems that doing something for the neighbourhood is the main reason, though some said they just like being in the open air, too. I think we'll still get quite a few more retired people to help, as they have more time than many of us. And finally, what are your plans for the future? Well, some people have suggested that we should organise regular meetings to keep people involved and interested. We could do a range of things to improve the environment and get involved in projects in other areas too. I'm thinking about that, but my priority right now is to get a place at university, and I'm hoping to study environmental science. I can't wait. Well, good luck with that. Thank you, Helen. That is the end of the interview. In a moment, you will hear exercise 5. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 5, Part A. You will hear a science teacher talking about omega-3s, natural substances that are very good for our health. Listen to the talk and complete the notes in Part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Today we're continuing with the topic of nutrition, the food that we eat and how it affects our health. In particular, I'm going to talk about omega-3s, which are a type of fatty acid. 
a natural substance that's really important for human health. Our bodies only produce minimal amounts of omega-3s, so that means we have to obtain them mostly from our diet. They're found in fish oils as well as in nuts, seeds and leafy green vegetables. Omega-3s are essential for a healthy brain. No matter what our age is, they've been shown to help the process of learning and specifically in later life they can improve memory. High levels of omega-3s enable the brain to communicate effectively. They are especially needed where messages or signals need to be sent between nerves, what we often call our brain cells. In fact, omega-3s are so important for our brains that some experts describe them as the building blocks on which our brains are made. There are many other reasons why we can't do without omega-3s. One is that our eyesight depends on them. Omega-3s are found in large amounts in the retina. That's the part of the eye that processes visual images so that we can see. And not only that, but omega-3s can be good for correcting blood pressure when it's above normal levels, and they help to keep the heart healthy. So I hope you are starting to see how vital they are. The list doesn't end there, though. Omega-3s are also very good for your skin. They appear to act like a kind of natural protective layer. For example, they keep out toxins that would have negative effects on your skin. They also allow minerals to be absorbed, such as sodium, potassium and magnesium, which are all important for the condition of your skin. Although omega-3s have been known to be essential for normal growth and health since the 1930s, awareness of their benefits has dramatically increased since the 1980s. For example, many studies have shown that it's important for a mother to have enough omega-3s when she's pregnant, and also that the child needs them in the first few years of its life. Improved intelligence is one of the known effects, and it also has a positive effect on children's behaviour. Now you will hear the talk again. Today we're continuing with the topic of nutrition, the food that we eat and how it affects our health. In particular, I'm going to talk about omega-3s, which are a type of fatty acid, a natural substance that's really important for human health. Our bodies only produce minimal amounts of omega-3s, so that means we have to obtain them mostly from our diet. They're found in fish oils as well as in nuts, seeds and leafy green vegetables. Omega-3s are essential for a healthy brain. No matter what our age is, they've been shown to help the process of learning and specifically in later life they can improve memory. High levels of omega-3s enable the brain to communicate effectively. They are especially needed where messages or signals need to be sent between nerves what we often call our brain cells. In fact, omega-3s are so important for our brains that some experts describe them as the building blocks on which our brains are made. There are many other reasons why we can't do without omega-3s. One is that our eyesight depends on them. Omega-3s are found in large amounts in the retina. That's the part of the eye that processes visual images so that we can see. And not only that, but omega-3s can be good for correcting blood pressure when it's above normal levels, and they help to keep the heart healthy. So I hope you are starting to see how vital they are. The list doesn't end there, though. Omega-3s are also very good for your skin. They appear to act like a kind of natural protective layer. For example, they keep out toxins that would have negative effects on your skin. They also allow minerals to be absorbed, such as sodium, potassium and magnesium, which are all important for the condition of your skin. Although omega-3s have been known to be essential for normal growth and health since the 1930s, awareness of their benefits has dramatically increased since the 1980s. 
For example, many studies have shown that it's important for a mother to have enough omega-3s when she's pregnant, and also that the child needs them in the first few years of its life. Improved intelligence is one of the known effects, and it also has a positive effect on children's behaviour. Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students about healthy eating and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. Have you done the homework on healthy eating yet? I've done some reading about it. I was interested in the types of food that omega-3s are found in. I wanted to check if I'm getting enough. I'm sure you are. You eat fish, don't you? Yes, though not all types of fish have high omega-3 levels. Oily fish such as salmon is better than white fish. I really like tuna, though apparently that doesn't have such high levels as other oily fish like herring or sardines. Oh, that's interesting. I found out that even if you eat foods that are high in omega-3s, there are some other types of food that actually prevent you from absorbing the omega-3s if you eat too much of them. What sort? Well, anything that's been processed, for example, like cakes or crisps. So we should be having much more of what we call whole foods, uh, raw vegetables, fruit, things like that. Mm, that makes sense. Did you look into the issue of taking vitamins too? Yes, there are arguments for and against that, aren't there? I didn't think there could be anything wrong with taking a vitamin pill each day. There's nothing wrong with people who have a healthy diet taking them. It's when they're using vitamins like an insurance policy. I think that's a useful way of looking at it. So you mean that they don't eat healthily, but by taking vitamins it makes them feel as if they are? Exactly. Mm. I usually take vitamin pills during the winter. You can take omega-3s in tablet form too, or as a liquid. That could be useful for some people. I read about a study which looked at a group of people in hospital who were quite ill. When they started taking omega-3s, the researchers noticed that they benefited by putting on a bit of weight, which really helped them with their recovery. Interesting. I read about studies on sleep. I was wondering if omega-3s would help you to fall asleep more quickly. You know, some people find it really hard to switch off at night. But what they found was that people sleep for longer, and the quality of their sleep is better too. Luckily, I don't have any problems sleeping. <laughs> Me neither. Now you will hear the conversation again. Have you done the homework on healthy eating yet? I've done some reading about it. I was interested in the types of food that omega-3s are found in. I wanted to check if I'm getting enough. I'm sure you are. You eat fish, don't you? Yes, though not all types of fish have high omega-3 levels. Oily fish such as salmon is better than white fish. I really like tuna, though apparently that doesn't have such high levels as other oily fish like herring or sardines. Oh, that's interesting. I found out that even if you eat foods that are high in omega-3s, there are some other types of food that actually prevent you from absorbing the omega-3s if you eat too much of them. What sort? Well, anything that's been processed, for example, like cakes or crisps. So we should be having much more of what we call whole foods, uh, raw vegetables, fruit, things like that. Mm, that makes sense. Did you look into the issue of taking vitamins too? Yes, there are arguments for and against that, aren't there? I didn't think there could be anything wrong with taking a vitamin pill each day. There's nothing wrong with people who have a healthy diet taking them. It's when they're using vitamins like an insurance policy. I think that's a useful way of looking at it. So you mean that they don't eat healthily, but by taking vitamins it makes them feel as if they are? Exactly. Mm. I usually take vitamin pills during the winter. 
You can take omega-3s in tablet form too, or as a liquid. That could be useful for some people. I read about a study which looked at a group of people in hospital who were quite ill. When they started taking omega-3s, the researchers noticed that they benefited by putting on a bit of weight, which really helped them with their recovery. Interesting. I read about studies on sleep. I was wondering if omega-3s would help you to fall asleep more quickly. You know, some people find it really hard to switch off at night. But what they found was that people sleep for longer, and the quality of their sleep is better too. Luckily, I don't have any problems sleeping. <laughs> Me neither. That is the end of question 8, and of the exam. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.